Thank you everyone for uh, attending this session. Um, it's called How to Media Management in the Age, Age of Netflix. So off the bat, how many of you work at a company that has digital content that you got to make available online somewhere? Show of hands. Everybody, right? Everybody these days. How many of you are kind of more on the technology side, whether it be systems administrator or developer? Show of hands. OK, some of you. How many of you are more on the production side, actually creating the content, editing the content, curating the content? Some of you. And how many of you are on the management side of things, where you have to make sure your team's actually doing what they're supposed to be doing? Some of you. All right, so we have multiple silos here. So my name's June Heider. I'm the director of technology at Realize Media. We're a strategic consultancy and custom video application development shop in Denver, Colorado. We build video players. So if you watched Super Bowl or Olympics online and that was our player that you're watching that through. We uh, design and deploy ECDNs and live streaming solutions for people that have locked down network infrastructures. Um, we love to build solutions to help manage live and VOD content for companies such as EA Games and Viacom. And we partner with industry leaders such as Wowza, Nginx, and Adobe. So let's talk about the problem. <clears throat> because things are changing. They've been shifting over the last several years, shifting more and more. So how many of you thought this was going to strictly be about media asset management? Raise your hands. Good. Um, I want to talk more about the life cycle of your content and things that you need to consider as you look to build new management solutions, play out solutions, analytic solutions. And also, think about how you can maximize the value of that content by utilizing some good best practices. How many of you are thinking of changing ex what you have right now in the near term? A couple of you. Who wants to optimize what they have so far? Come on, everybody should raise their hand on that one. All right, <clears throat> so yeah, we think holistically. We care about the full life cycle of the asset as soon as it goes from what's in front of the camera all the way out to an end user, and then that feedback loop. We care to know if our users are watching our content, and once they are, we need to figure out why are they watching that content. Another problem we're having here is we're continually increasing the quality of our video and the size of our video. Granted, luckily, we're not streaming that amount of data for just one simple movie. But <clears throat> you could see that growth is, is something that we need to get a hand of soon. For instance, you know, with NHK trying to stream 8K for the 2020 Olympics, you know, these are things to keep in mind. If it's not from a streaming perspective, it's from a sheer data management perspective. It's a lot of data, and it costs money to store. Then we also have tons of different kinds of screens, right? So before, it used to be like leave it to beaver days, when we have this TV with rabbit ears and all that stuff. And then we started watching with real video. We started watching things on laptops and desktops. And then the mobile phone came out, and we started watching things on our phone. And then all these connected devices started coming out. You know, Apple TV, Chromecast, et cetera. Well, the thing is, is all of those devices still exist. It's not like the laptop replaced the TV, which then the phone replaced the other two. So now we got to like send our content to all these different devices. These are some pretty interesting statistics um, that I've found. For instance, in 2016, there's so much content being uploaded in 30 days that it was the same amount of content or more than three major US TV networks did in 30 years. That's pretty staggering. And then um, Cisco predicts that by 2021, video is going to take up 80% of all internet-related traffic. So you know that's, that's a lot of traffic. And then finally, this was the most interesting one. 
In November of 2017, somebody published a report that said a billion minutes, a billion minutes of TV is viewed on PCs, mobiles, and tablets. That's not counting the people that are watching it on regular you know, cable access or over the air. So this is huge scale. And it's going to keep getting bigger. <clears throat> so let's plan for some change. So any of you that's been involved in trying to figure out some kind of management solution for your data at rest, not being played back by people, but you know, as you're working on it, as you're you know, archiving it, et cetera, you know, we've kind of gone through this evolution where originally people were utilizing digital asset managers, you know, and primarily those were kind of meant to handle text and images and marketing collateral, things like that. But then as soon as video kind of exited from the broadcast industry and kind of seeped its way throughout government and education and even, you know, regular commercial industries that need marketing materials, they've started to kind of take a role of, of managing video as well. But the problem with the dam is it's kind of like a jack of all trades. So it's really, really good with where it originated, which was dealing with you know, non-video assets. But then when we start talking about like 4K and 8K assets and having to like sync up with Premiere Pro, they start to break down. So that's when we started to go in the direction of, okay, let's start handling video. So we came out with media asset managers. So solutions like Delect Galaxy 5 and Squarebox Systems CatDV. They're very, very similar in concept to a digital asset manager, but they take on more of a role of managing that large media library. So there's a lot more features built into these media asset managers that are specific to video that don't necessarily exist in digital asset managers. From there, you know, there's a need for people to collaborate. So when you watch a movie at the movie theater, it's not just one person with a camera that recorded something and then they you know, published it out to the theaters. I mean, there's a whole team, a large team of people that need to work on this media. So the PAM, the production asset manager, started to evolve. And the gist between a PAM and a MAM is a PAM is more geared towards um, the ability to collaborate as you're working through the production of a piece of content. So think of things like you know, being able to comment, being able to have panels um, in Premiere Pro that allow you to sync you know, your large assets with possibly a smaller rendition, um, being able to work through approval workflows and, and things like that. Production asset managers help with that. There's a list of some of them, uh, VSN Explorer, Avid Media Central, Frame.io is a pretty interesting one. They actually not only say that we're a production asset manager, but we have fast file transfer as well. Because remember that slide earlier, as we start working with larger resolution content, <laughs> we need to, our internet pipe is only so fast. So we gotta be able to get that content back and forth um, quickly. The other thing that's kind of started coming out is the OVP, so the online video platform. Um, some of these, obviously the most well-known one is YouTube. Um, that's kind of what started this movement. And then we have companies such as Brightcove. Another one you haven't heard of maybe might uh, be Zype. And I think Zype might be here, maybe not. Um, they're pretty interesting. And then Facebook Live. Right, Facebook Live, I think, launched like 2015-ish. Um, and Facebook's really cool because there's your audience and getting your content up there is not terribly difficult. And then they manage all that infrastructure for you. So that's the nice benefit about an OVP, an online video platform, is that oftentimes it's your job to hold the camera and grab your content. And then at that point, once you upload it to their systems, they kind of handle the rest for you. You don't have to worry about spinning up servers you know, underneath your desk um, and having to make sure that you're taking backups of all your terabyte drives that are connected to your workstation. They kind of deal, deal with that for you. <clears throat> There's even more. And if you noticed on the last slide at the bottom, 
each one has a purpose and a focus. A lot of times when people build a product, they have a specific use case in mind, or they only have a certain kind of siloed view of the problem. So, so products usually kind of either solve something specifically or they go for like an 80%, where it's like, well, 80% of users will do this and 20% will do this, but we care about the larger number because there's no way that we're ever gonna solve every problem for every person that's ever gonna use our system. So each one of these solutions that I've shown on this slide, oops, and this slide, you know, they're gonna have their own kind of focus. So like with Telstream Cloud, Telstream is a hosted transcoding platform and they allow for also some workflow automation. So in other words, you know, you can configure this workflow and we'll talk about those later. And they do time text transcriptions and quality assurance as well. Does anybody use Wowza Streaming Cloud? So Wowza is a company that's had this uh, streaming engine for a long time. So what it allow you to do is it allow you to have your camera and your encoder send an RTMP stream up to a server, and then that server would process that video and make it available to you know, HTML-based players on the internet. So what they did is they took that into a more OVP kind of hosting model where they also now, in, in addition to having the server that you gotta manage on your own hardware, they have the Wowza Streaming Cloud where you basically pay them to manage it for you. Then your job is to create that stream and send your content up there and configure you know, what your channel looks like or whatnot, and you're off to the races. Bitmovin and Mux are pretty interesting as well. The difference um, about Bitmovin and Mux is whereas a lot of these solutions are very graphical and, and targeted toward the, the end user that's actually going to use this system, Bitmovin and Mux are targeted towards developers. So if you're in the, you know, if you have the luxury of building a targeted solution specifically for your company and you have some development skills in-house, those are the platforms that you're going to want to look at because they allow you to create your own user interface, they allow you to integrate with other services, um, and their focus is, hey, we're gonna expose our stuff so that you can build an application that uses our stuff. So that's kind of the interesting thing about their platforms. And the list goes on and on. I mean, I've done a lot of research for clients and for myself, and Every single time I type my search terms in a Google search, there's a new solution out there. So there's a lot of solutions out there, um, but those are some of the you know, key ones that I've seen in the past. So this is a very important thing. So how many of you are like kind of in a government use case? Broadcast industry? Retail? Like you know, you're creating content for ads for your products. News? A couple of news. Some people are raising their hands multiple times, but that's cool. They're probably consultants. <clears throat> so these aren't 100% complete use cases for each one of these verticals, but I wanted to kind of call out some of the different kinds of use cases that you'll see when you think about your media in a very holistic way. So with news, one of the biggest use cases, especially if you're not just in the United States, is multiple languages. You know, you have all of these countries that are, you know, really crammed together, and you need to be able to produce your content so that everybody in these different countries can consume your content. Then there's clips, right? So somebody may be on site filming this breaking news. Uh, maybe it's a hurricane, or maybe, you know, uh, factory caught on fire, whatever it is, um, you're not necessarily gonna to wanna to show all of that content. So being able to create clips very quickly and near real time is an important feature to have. And then one thing that news industry has been leveraging a lot lately is social media. So oftentimes if you go to your favorite newscaster, they're gonna have the companion Twitter feed or the companion Facebook page where they not only you know, produce their news for over the air or cable, 
but they also publish you know, the most uh, popular and interesting clips up to their social media um, channels. So those are three interesting use cases. The other thing to consider is uh, the sports use case. So how many of you are with sports companies? Okay, I see more hands this time. So cameras are filming this game, the stream is coming in, and as that's coming in, people are wildly logging everything that they're seeing happening. Ah, oh, somebody scored a goal, there was a foul, et cetera, et cetera. And then also making clips of that. So similar to a news use case where you want to generate some clips so that you could possibly push them up to Twitter and say, hey, basically tune in and watch the game because this cool goal happened where the guy did a backflip and kicked it into the, the goal. <clears throat> government. So government you know, brings up compliance. I'm not saying that any of these other verticals you know, don't need compliance, but government is especially prone to compliance. So making sure that the video that's being uploaded meet, meets certain criteria, or possibly maybe you're not infringing on something, or maybe you're not violating some kind of law because the people in the video are too young, or whatever it is. Um, so compliance is another use case when you think about your media you know, holistically. Law enforcement, think about how much video is being generated by security cameras across the globe. That's a lot of video. Who would want to sit there and watch all of that video to note any kind of incident? <laughs> no, right? Um, so having a law enforcement use case that you could potentially look into automating surveillance, that's something to consider if any of you work for law enforcement. And then finally, the thing that a lot of people in the private sector need to keep in mind is large audience. So there's a reason why companies like Akamai come to these events, is because we want to make sure that we scale so that our millions of users that want to tune into our soccer game can actually watch that game and not see buffering because our servers can't handle it. Whoops. Phone's being weird. So here are some limitations. Every organization has its limits. The most notable one is you only have a certain number of humans that work at your organization. That's a key thing, humans. Um, they have a limited amount of time. So you know, normally you're going to work an eight-hour day. Well, if you have 24-7 live streams coming in and possibly 10 or 11 channels, how are you going to monitor that? I mean, you could scrub through really quickly, but what if your use case requires a more granular view of that content? There's a limited amount of time. There's a limited amount of resource. You know, in the sports scenario, you may only have one person that has the capabilities and attention to details to be able to log a game as it's happening. There's also budget. Does anybody have an unlimited budget here? Come on, one person. Um, you know, so we always have to weigh cost. Because we could go out and buy the most expensive, you know, OVP platform because we're doing like, you know, a million concurrent users for every event. But most of the time, that's not within our budget. So we got to keep that in mind as well. Geography is a big one. How many of you have people that work from different countries across the globe? A couple of you. But it's starting to happen more and more. Like a lot, of, a lot of sites, when I go to company sites, I scroll down to the bottom, the contact area, and it says, New York, London, Singapore. And especially when you're thinking about production, going back to that first slide where it was like 120 terabytes for raw 8K video, think about if your production team is geographically dispersed. How are you going to handle editing that you know, and collaborating on that? Large library, a client I was talking to not long ago said that they needed to deal with a 1.2 petabyte library of content. <laughs> yeah, I can't put that on my laptop. There's no way. <clears throat> and then finally, a lack of in-house development skills. 
So how many of you have actual developers at your company? OK, that's a good sign. A good, I'd say a third of you do. And that's going to come into play here in a sec. So think about the things that you want to add. Is it more screens? Do you want to be able to make sure that you can play to connected devices? You know, some use cases may not. If you're in government, you may not necessarily want to have to support an Apple TV or maybe even a mobile device because you don't want them connecting to your network. So you got to think about what connected devices you want. And then more concurrent users, you know, not only are people using CDNs these days, they're using multiple CDNs these days. There's even solutions that are built around the fact that there are multiple CDNs being used, but even that isn't enough. So they have these companion solutions that kind of use peer-assisted delivery to help with those CDNs, or there's you know, CDN optimizers that are out there that kind of assess how your player is, how, how long it's taking it for it to get content. So <clears throat> more concurrent users. There was a study that I saw recently, I think it may have been streaming media, but um, a good number of respondents do like a million streams or more. That's a lot of streams. AI is um, something that a lot of people are very, very interested in right now. At like 3.45 or so, I'm going to be giving a talk on AI and all the different platforms that there are for AI down the hall. But AI is very, very big. It's a buzzword. You know, you can leverage artificial intelligence for things like metadata processing and analytics and production automation. Has anybody seen the AI-generated um, video? Uh, this is a trailer for a movie called Morgan, I think. Yeah, that was pretty cool. So a movie trailer that wasn't generated by a human. I mean, obviously, the human probably took all of the camera footage, but the computer created the trailer. And I think they're starting to do that on Netflix. I feel. I, I think they need to change the music that they have. Play for me, at least. <clears throat> Content ROA. So searchability and discovery. If you think back to the client I mentioned that had like 1.2 petabytes of content, imagine like trying to find that one really brilliant piece of content from like 20 years ago in this huge like library of media. So keeping in mind that once it goes into the system, you're going to need a way to pull it back out. If you can't pull it back out efficiently, it loses its value because you're going to forget or it's going to take too many man hours to get that video out so that you can use it. And then in addition to that, you have people watching your content. So making that content more discoverable, especially tuned to like their personal preferences, that's very important in generating some ROI out of your content as well. So here's my takeaways. Uh, solution, I feel, is going to be an intelligent integration of products between multiple vendors. And the deployment infrastructure, in most cases, will most likely be hybrid. If you have like something on-prem that you've had for years and years and years and has like you know a terabyte or a petabyte worth of data and all this additional you know metadata and captions and whatnot, you may not necessarily want to move all that. But you could enhance it with something in the cloud. And then some of you already have developers. And even if you don't bring them on staff, being able to reach out to some developers to help you with a little bit of glue is going to you know, be valuable, very val valuable. Keep your developers in check, though. Keep them on target with what the actual business goal is. Because as a developer, I know it's really, really, really easy to go down that rabbit hole because I find it interesting. So just keep them on check, keep them focused, have daily scrums, whatever it is. Um, break down silos. So I know that when I asked what role you guys played within your organizations, I feel that a really good strategy for an organization is to bring all these people together with a common goal. You know, don't do this like thing where it's like, well, it's not my problem because I don't want to. I don't work on the servers, so go talk to that team. Like right there, that's the, that's the first breakdown. And then pay attention to the pulse of the media industry and adapt. And I think you're already doing that because you're at streaming media conferences. Woo! -hoo! <laughs> All right. So strategy. 
This is a big one. Most of us don't have the luxury to start from scratch, unless you're a startup. Anybody in a startup here? No, okay. So if you're planning to either migrate away or enhance what you have, a very critical thing is to define your metadata strategy. You want to review your existing metadata. And I don't mean just looking at every single metadata field that you've ever defined that people can populate. I'm talking about what pieces of metadata do you actually use? And what pieces of metadata, when you think about it in the context of searchability and discoverability and analytics, would you might want to require to be used going forward? So, so analyze your metadata and plan for new metadata schemes or a new metadata schema. So in other words, you know, what you have might have been working, but if you want to add that you know, AI feature or whatnot, you may have to create new metadata fields within your scheme to suit that new data coming in. And then determine a taxonomy that suits you. So taxonomy is going to help when you have a system that's basically a front end to your database of media. You want to be able to make it easy for users to find, not only users, but yourselves as well. So if I know if I drill down into sports, I can go to football and I can go to Super Bowl. So creating a good taxonomy that makes sense for your own organization. So here's an example of a metadata schema. And this one's targeted at you know, television shows. So <clears throat> it's kind of washed out. But from left to right, we have some tabs. So we have some general metadata. We have some licensing metadata. We have some technical specs. And we have a test tab because it's an edit mode. And I was just playing around. But then from there, in the general metadata, we have things like title, description, language, when it was created. We have the TV rating. We have tags that we want to add. Maybe it's you know, Dexter, or maybe it's um, Sesame Street. Um, and then on the right, we have flight times. right? So sometimes you want to make sure your content's available only at specific times. So that would be if it, that use case is important to you, those would be metadata fields you'd have within your schema. Here's another example of metadata. So this is from Frame.io, Production Asset Manager. If you'll notice, the metadata here, the end user wouldn't really necessarily care about that unless they're trying to find you know, videos to buy from you that, that they want to make sure meets their needs. Or, you're a production guy, and you're trying to find something with the AVC codec um, that you know, has a certain dimension, et cetera, et cetera. So you may decide that not only do you have that kind of TV-centric metadata, but you'll probably want this as well in case you have some new 4K um, shows that are coming out, and you want to find corresponding 4K shows that you can throw into like a playlist with them. And then this is kind of taxonomy. I have a link to the awesome case study I read. Um, go ahead and pull that down. But this, I wanted to illustrate that. It, it does a very good job of that. Where we go from the left, where we have a sports taxonomy, and it starts off with basketball, and NCAA men, NCAA women. Then you got baseball, MLB, football, NCAA, NFL. Then you move to the middle, where you have more of like a news taxonomy where you, know, you have United States domestic, international world, sports, business. And then finally, on the right, we have like a fashion site taxonomy, where designers is the main section, but then we go to Fashion Week, and we have one in Paris and one in uh, New York. So think about your taxonomy, because your taxonomy is not going to be the same as somebody else's taxonomy. Metadata is important. It helps to structure your library and groups of related content. So the way I think of that is I'm sitting here in my Media Asset Manager, and I want to find videos on AI from Streaming Media East 2018, and also videos on Flash video experiences back from 2005. If I have good metadata, it's going to be easy for me to find that content. And then assisting with searching. You know, imagine I'm sitting, I'm trying to find like something to post up to our Twitter feed, 
where did I store that nature video about gorillas that was filmed back in 1992? Good metadata is going to help with that. Or maybe I'm trying to uh, create a blog post about a really cool scene that a, you know, would entice you to watch actual episodes of a show. So where do I find that clip of Tom Hanks and Jerry Seinfeld laughing in a car? You know, so having good metadata allows you to do those kinds of things. And then helping with discovery and recommendations, um, using AI to parse the metadata and to make recommendations to users. So we're talking about metadata. Workflow. So workflow is important, too. You may already have an existing workflow that works really well for your team. Do not ditch that workflow. Look over that workflow and figure out the pieces that really are valid and make sense for your team, and what are the pieces that could be enhanced or optimized. And you can plan as a team, all three silos, work on your revisions and your enhancements, and automate whatever you can. So here's an example workflow from Telstream site. Um, from left to right, the first thing that happens is there's a watch folder that you throw all of your new camera footage into. After that, some notifications happen, a record is created, it's um, kind of looked through and transcoded, and then it's synchronized to the record, and then people are notified so that they know that this new asset is available and ready. Another workflow, this one's from Aspera site, but that's Telstream as well, this product at least. You're going to receive in a video. When you do that, you're going to do some quality checking on it to make sure it's OK. Because you don't want to have to transcode the video if it's you know, garbage. Garbage in, garbage out. So at that point, that workflow will say, don't even waste time on this. Stop. From there, if it's good, then you'll transcode it. And then you'll use Aspera, which is a fast transfer client, to put that up into the cloud where you store all the rest of your media. Here's another workflow. This workflow was um, from Dillette. And this has to do with IMF. So you know, the first thing that happens, it commutes IMF defaults. And then it goes and it does a copy while it also changes the caption file from TTML to MXF. And then it does transcoding as well. And then it inserts the app data, generates the hash, creates the IMF metadata. And then it passes it through Netflix Photon to verify that it's all good. So another QC check. Anywhere in here, you could add a manual step that says, hey, I have an expert, and they're very, very picky and want to make sure that this is exactly to my standard. You could throw in a step here that's manual approval. So you know, get creative with your workflows. But try and automate what you can so that the important stuff is, is what you have time to do. This workflow is actually out of um, AEM. AEM is a DAM that also supports video. Um, this starts with like metadata processing and FFmpeg thumbnails. Then it does some EPS stuff, does some transcoding. And then it creates some sub-assets. It does a page extraction using InDesign. Does some rasterization, dynamic uh, video processing, where it uploads it to AEM's like, hosting cloud. And then you know, it updates the product asset record. So workflows are very powerful. And every, I can guarantee like basically every single one of you is going to want a different workflow, at least a little bit different. It's up to your team on what works for you. And the nice thing about workflows is they're a way to automate while keeping things flexible, especially if you think about it at this very granular component level. So here's some ideas of, of things that you'll want to think about as you define your workflow. You know, how do you ensure that you can automatically generate the 11 bit rate renditions that Apple recommends in their ladder? <laughs> well, use a workflow. Um, how do you validate custom M3 U8 you generate is compliant with the spec? It's another workflow step. How do you ensure the appropriate party? How do you make sure that they're notified when metadata is missing or needs to be reviewed? And then, how do you make sure that if you're using multi-CDN, you're uploading to Akamai level three and what, Limelight, maybe? How do you make sure that happens? 
without having to like sit in front of the computer and watch it. And then how do you make sure you can find these assets three years from now? And the reason I threw that in there is if you have a really good metadata schema and you ensure that that metadata is required and it's checked and then the asset goes into the system, all right, you're pretty safe that you can pull up Streaming Media East 2005 and find that flash video content. So APIs and SDKs galore. So this is where your developers come in. This is a very, very API heavy world these days. Um, they allow you to interact with external systems and services so that you can basically take something else somebody wrote and built and you don't have to do it yourself. You just build the glue between your system and theirs. It helps you with an SDK. You can accelerate the development of your applications by using an SDK. So for instance, you know, you want to start streaming to Roku. I bet there's an SDK that has some starting templates that you can leverage and build on top of. So APIs and SDKs accelerate you know, time to market for the various new features in your system. <clears throat> and they also allow your business developers to stay focused on what's valuable to your business without having to learn how to parse through like an M3U8 if they don't already know how. API, a general workflow. So I'm going to you know, click upload, or I'm going to click you know, transcode, or whatever it is. So as a user, or through those workflow steps that are being automated through my system, I'm going to make a request. At that point, I take that request and any kind of you know, authentication data and send it up to the API. Then I wait. Sometimes I'll pull and kind of, hey, are you done? Hey, are you done? Either way, what happens is that API is going to send that data back. And it's either going to say, hey, good job. You sent up everything I needed to get your job done. Here's your data. Or it's going to say, no, nah, you forgot X piece of data. I failed. I couldn't do what you needed me to do. And then at that point, it's you know, up to your application developer to take that response and, and deal with it. <clears throat> so here's some examples of things that have been exposed through APIs. So if you want to do multi-DRM, Microsoft Azure does that. So there's a company called EasyDRM. They have APIs that you can interact with so that you don't have to build multi-DRM from ground up. <laughs> that, that wouldn't be very fun. Um, and then this company called uh, DLVR Deliver, they are the kind of proactive multi-CDN monitoring company that I was referencing earlier. You can basically kind of inject some libraries into your player, and then they do a lot of work for you, saying, hey, you should source from Akamai right now because they're stronger than uh, you know, CenturyLink because they don't have as much traffic at 12 AM right now. <clears throat> then there's uh, Streamroot.io. That's pure assisted CDN. So they actually sit in front of your CDN. And it's peer assisted where if my coworker who's sitting in the back, Phil, is watching the same video as me in Denver, and the CDN's slow because a bunch of people are downloading you know, the latest macOS update, I can say, hey, Phil, do you have that content? Yep, here you go. And then I don't have to hit the CDN. Sometimes Phil may be you know, too busy because he's downloading a bunch of files. And at that point, then I can go to the CDN. So that ex is exposed through an API as well. So is Veloso. So Veloso is a really cool AI-based um, video recognition and content intelligence system. So they have the kinds of services that can look at your video. The computer looks at your video and can extract the audio. It can extract any of the facial detection or objects that it sees and tell you exactly where it saw them. I wouldn't ever want to try and build that on my own. So I am very grateful to them and some of these other vendors for exposing APIs so that I can build an app and get these features. They can focus on how awesome these features are. I can focus on building something that makes sense for my company and provides us value. <clears throat> Players. Players are important, right? Because that's how people actually see your content when, at the end of the day. So JW Player has been around forever. Um, they have a video platform, or you could just use their player. But they do have Android and iOS SDKs in addition to their HTML player SDK. So if you don't want to have to build your own video player from the ground up, 
feel free to check them out. Applicaster is pretty interesting as well. They have a ton of different platforms, um, and they're basically kind of player application starters. And this is something I'm seeing kind of um, a lot of companies are starting to do this, where it's like, hey, you want to go OTT to all the devices? We have some you know, out-of-the-box apps that you can like, basically you know, plug in and send up to the store and, and, and put your own look and field on top. But we'll do the video streaming and stuff for you. Theo Player is another one. So they got HTML, Android, and iOS as well. And then, you know, one of our favorites, because we have a good number of developers in our shop, is HLSJS. So there's a number of open source libraries out there that can be leveraged. When you're using open source, though, be very careful to make sure to review what the open source license is. They're not all created equal. A good one is like MIT. Another good one is Apache 2. So just pay attention to that. When you start seeing like GPL and LGPL and, and things like that, that's when you really need to like talk to your lawyer and make sure you're good. Because sometimes they'll say, hey, you can use our stuff for free, but in return, if you build on top of it or if you add more stuff to it, you got to donate it to the public. You may not necessarily want to do that. <clears throat> so there's a lot of different open source library um, licenses. I don't know all of them. Just, just keep that in mind. <clears throat> Analytics. So analytics are important. That's the feedback loop. So now you've like hooked up your player, you have your backend system with your workflows and your metadata schemas, and now you want your users to play back content. And while they're doing that, you're generating all this data. And you're saying, hey, you know, what did they actually play? How long did they play it? Was it buffering? Was there a bunch of black screens or whatever? <clears throat> so you have uh, things like Comscore, Audience Analytics. Conviva actually has this AI-based al alert, which is kind of interesting. So they have you know, audience experience metrics, but they also built this new product um, that has sensors spread throughout you know, pr global points of presence, as I'm sure, or you can do it. I'm not sure which one. Um, and those sensors will pay attention to your streams in various places and says, ah, there's a lot of buffering happening right now, or it's really slow, or I'm just getting the 300 kilobit per second bit rate, things like that. That's pretty powerful. And then uh, Google Analytics, actually, that's a really good link. Um, I'll have to change these to links. I'll make these slides available if you want them. Um, Google Analytics is primarily for page analytics, but there's this guy that figured out a really good way to get some powerful video analytics out of Google Analytics. And that's something that a lot of developers are pretty familiar with, rather than having to make them learn like Comscore or Conviva. Freewheel, ads, right? We need to be able to serve ads most of the time because we want to generate revenue, unless we're like subscription-based or government. But if you care about ads, like Freewheel is a pretty big one right now. Uh, they have server-side ad insertion. <clears throat> so proxies. Proxies are golden. I love proxies. So think of a proxy as kind of a placeholder or a low res version of the actual thing. They're powerful because if you think about that 8K example I gave where you know the raw content was like 120. Uh, terabytes, a proxy, you can create a proxy that's much smaller. So maybe it's like, you know, 300, 400 meg, whatever, much, much smaller. And then at that point, you can do your like rough edits against that proxy. And you can do that globally, right? Because you might have a geographically dispersed team. <clears throat> and then once you're finally ready to commit, you can say, great, we know exactly what we're going to do. Bam, click save then things happen on that source media. You don't even have to move it. You can just have it stay there, and you can work against that, and then create you know, whatever streaming assets you need, and you're off to the races. You know, rather than like, taking you know, the 10 drives that that content's on, putting it in a box, and like, shipping it, or figuring out some other weird sneaker net way to like, transfer that data. <clears throat> the other thing, too, is when you have a proxy, 
it allows you, if, if your current system has some way to expose that metadata and that content, like where it lives and what the structure is, you can create a proxy in the new system. That way you don't have to move anything out of the old system, but you can still reference all that data existing in that previous system. So here's some examples of proxies. Um, these are diagrams I have. <clears throat> and I think I'm done, but a couple more slides. Anybody in a rush to get out? So you can, but if not, stay and I'll continue. So a proxy, and I'm gonna come walk down here. Proxy record goes into our DAM or our MAM or our OVP or whatever it is. In this case, it's AEM. So that's a proxy record. We're gonna do all this stuff behind the scenes. The end user doesn't really know unless we're exposing, like monitoring the workflow or whatever. So we're gonna ingest data. We're gonna like throw it up to a S3 bucket. We're gonna run it through video AI processing. We may tie it to a Salesforce record if we're doing like some marketing stuff. All this stuff's happening behind the scene. And you'll notice that the real assets up here, and theoretically, we could just stream this from CloudFront if we wanted to. <clears throat> but they see this proxy. So it allows us to kind of like break our system up into components. We also have this right here. So when I'm talking about a geographically dispersed team, you know, we have a server running on prem, and this is Mo. Um, it's our server, <clears throat> and then we put that on-prem, it watches a shared file storage, so you can have production teams all around the world doing things, and then if for some reason the people in Sydney need what's in DC, they can leverage something like Aspera or File Catalyst or Signet, do an accelerated transfer up to the main storage, so the central storage, so that they can pull it back down. And the reason you wouldn't go direct is if you're gonna transfer it, you might as well transfer it fast, transfer it back down. That way it's there for the future and it will get backed up, push to Glacier if you have archival needs, things like that. But the key thing is, is this whole time, these users are working with a proxy and everything behind the scenes, they don't really know unless we add some metadata that says, this was sourced from Sydney. And so it allows for, <laughs> It allows for the hybrid where we have cloud and then we have on-prem. So on-premise at different locations throughout the world. As I mentioned earlier, don't just ditch everything you have. You know, I talked to a client once and they were like, hey, we have like, you know, 300 terabytes of content and we wanna just upload it to the cloud. We have this pre-existing media asset management system and we just wanna move away and it's like, well, is it doing what it needs to do? Yeah, cool. Is there an API? Yeah, good. Keep that there and let's talk about where we're gonna ingest our new assets, but we'll add a link back to that old system in case we ever need to go back to that content. Don't worry about paying to move it up to the cloud. Keep it where it's at for now. If you need to move it, great, then pay. If you don't, don't worry about it. And you can think about parallel pilot where Keep your existing system, but then from there, put your new system next to it, so that way you don't like pull the trigger and find out it's not gonna work. That'll allow you to tweak, and you're not slowing down your production. So, I don't have time for demos, but if you have any questions, feel free. The main thing is, is consider your use case, plan ahead diligently, metadata is key, APIs and automation are your friends, Work together, all of your silos, management, engineering, production, have the same goal, and finally, pay attention and adapt. Thank you for coming to my presentation. If you wanna bring your card up, feel free. If you have any questions, feel free. I also have cards up here. Enjoy the rest of your day. <laughs>